Thank you for the like. I don't think so. I think it's so. fine. So I want to ask you a question. So what I have to do my correspondence to mm -hmm. Uh, if I want to, this is Charles Chateau asking the question, is this like the overpowering? Oh, I don't think so. No? It's not overpowering now. So I think it's good. Thank you. were involved in a shooting at St. Alphonsus in Boise early yesterday morning. Right, and that's the shooting we've been following. It left three Department of Correction officers hurt, one of them in critical condition. Here's what we know at this time. Police tell us that Skylar Mead, an Idaho Department of Correction inmate, he was at St. Alphonsus Hospital where he was receiving treatment for what we were told was a self-injurious incident or a self-inflicted injury. We understand that happened late Tuesday night. Then on Wednesday morning, when he was being put back in the prison van, talking about Mead, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning yesterday. Police say another man, Nicholas Umfenor, who's on the right of your screen right there with the beard, he showed up, began shooting at officers. Both Mead and Umfenor got away. Mead is a documented member of the Aryan Knights gang. That's a white supremacist prison gang in Idaho. He, was, he has Aryan Knights tattoos on each side of his face. You can't see it in that photo there. Umfenor is 5'11", 160 pounds. He has brown hair and hazel eyes. Police believe they are, or at least were, driving a 2020 gray Honda Civic with license plate number 2TDF43U. We are certainly going to ask the question of law enforcement whether or not they're still in that car, if they have information about that. Two of the officers who were shot have non-life-threatening injuries. The third is in critical but stable condition. Both men are believed to be armed and dangerous. If you have any information or if you see them, call 911 
and do not approach them. It's also important to note that police are saying Umfenor shot two of those IDOC officers. Yeah. We do understand that the third officer was shot by a Boise police officer who showed up to the scene at the St. Alphonsus Ambulance Bay and saw an armed man in what they call their khakis and blacks, yeah. uh, that IDOC uniform, and shot that third IDOC officer. A very chaotic situation, mm -hmm. of course. This was about 2 o'clock in the morning yesterday. Again, we are standing by waiting for a news conference right now with Boise police. We understand the Idaho State Police will be there mm -hmm. as well as the Idaho Department of Corrections. Uh, you may remember of about 24 hours ago, Boise police, IDOC, they were able to give us some updates in a live news conference. That was about 1 o'clock yesterday. But uh, Morgan, I know there's a lot of questions out there right now. Yeah. Of course, across social media, there are some people that are claiming there's been sightings. There's mm -hmm. claims about cars being switched. So we're hoping to get some real information from police about what is a fact and what's not community rumor. Right. And they had a media briefing yesterday where they provided all the latest information. Uh, at that time, Umfenor hadn't been identified. He was identified last night. But we did hear about a possible sighting up in Valley County, and I was talking to the Valley County Sheriff yesterday. Uh, they had posted on Facebook that they'd received a sighting tip, that somebody saw that 2020 Honda Civic potentially, and the sheriff said that the description was the same as the car, but that the license plate matched partially to the license plate number that we've been given now for that car. Uh, he said that they weren't able to get eyes on and actually confirm whether that tip was legitimate or not. So again, Valley County posted this on social media, but they weren't able to confirm whether or not those two individuals were seen in Valley County, or excuse me, in Idaho County. It was Valley County deputies who responded, but that sighting was allegedly in Idaho County. In the investigation right now, it's going in two separate directions. You have one, the active search for these two men that mm -hmm. are on your screen right now, but Morgan also looking backwards in terms of what happened here. How is this coordinated? How is this able to even be a possibility that IDOC officers were ambushed like this and mm -hmm. somebody was able to get away? Uh, so we know that the investigators, they're going through a lot of different situations. We understood yesterday from Chief Weiniger from Boise Police that they were getting a lot of tips. There was tips that was coming in. Sometimes tips may be more valuable than others. Um, you also understand, though, as we were talking, that these guys could have gotten pretty far. But we do understand that the press conference is about to start. Uh, I believe we want to get there right now. This is Boise Police Chief Ron Weininger. It is my pleasure to welcome you today. Also, today you will be hearing from Lieutenant Colonel Sheldon Kelly of the Idaho State Police, as well as Director Josh T. Walt of the Idaho Department of Correction. Also present here with me is Ada County Sheriff Matt Clifford. This is but a small representation of the number of different agencies that have assisted in this investigation to this point, and we are grateful for their help. I want to begin today by announcing that right around 2 p.m. this afternoon, following a lengthy investigation, the two suspects who we have been seeking were located in Twin Falls, in the Twin Falls area. There was a short vehicle pursuit and both suspects were taken into custody separately. There were no shots fired or extensive use of force in this operation, for which we are thankful. Obviously that just occurred within less than an hour and so we do not have a lot of details about the arrest right now, but we do have some more information to share with you and we will be gathering those details and providing them as soon as we possibly can. And we uh, once again want to make known Skylar Mead and Nicholas Umfenauer are in custody. Would like to turn the time now over to Lieutenant Colonel Sheldon Kelly of the Idaho State Police because this investigation has grown immensely over the last 24 to 36 hours and has involved a number of different uh, entities and crimes across the state of Idaho and so uh, to speak to some of those and answer uh, questions as well Lieutenant Colonel Kelly. Thank you Chief. Uh, again my name is Sheldon Kelly. Uh, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel with the Idaho State Police. I'm Chief of Operations. Uh, first off I want to thank all the law enforcement agencies across Idaho that have assisted with this. Uh, I know it's the Idaho way but uh, there was an immense collaboration and cooperation all across the state uh, to come to this conclusion. Uh, ever since this incident kicked off, we've had professionals working tirelessly on this issue uh, to get to the point where we are today. Uh, 
Through the course of this investigation, uh, detectives located the Honda Accord that was used in the escape near Leland, Idaho. Additionally, law enforcement in investigating, we are investigating two homicides at separate locations in Nez Perce and Clearwater counties. These are potentially tied to this incident. Both homicides involve adult males and detectives are actively investigating. No further information on the homicides is available at this time and the county coroner will provide identity uh, as well as the official cause of death on those. Uh, like the chief said uh, at the end of this, if you have some questions, if I can't answer my will, it is an ongoing inf uh, investigation and to not taint that, we're not gonna be able to share everything. And uh, now I'd like to uh, let the director of Idaho, Idaho Department of Corrections, Josh Seewald, uh, give an update on his folks. Thank you, Colonel. My name is Josh T. Walt. I'm the director for the Idaho Department of Correction. Uh, first, uh, just nothing but appreciation for uh, the, the cooperative effort from federal, state, and local law enforcement throughout Idaho and even neighboring states for their cooperation uh, in helping to bring uh, these two suspects to justice. Uh, we were able to share the news moments ago with our two staff members who remain in the hospital, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, safe to say their spirits were lifted. Uh, we know, uh, to give you an update on their condition, uh, one of our, our officers was released from the hospital last evening. Uh, while two remain in the hospital, uh, they are, they're stable, improving, and I think with today's news, uh, their spirits are lifted. Um, just to provide a little bit of context on uh, the other suspect who we believe uh, helped Skylar Mead uh, escape and who uh, actively um, uh, attacked our staff yesterday morning, uh, Nicholas Umfenauer. Uh, we'll be posting uh, a little bit more information uh, about his, his criminal history and time with us at the Department of Correction to our website, and we'll share that uh, to state police, BPD, uh, as well for them to distribute. Um, but once he was identified as a potential suspect yesterday, our investigators, along with cooperation from other law enforcement partners, uh, began trying to tie him with Skylar Mead. Um, in addition to having uh, both having membership with the Aryan Knights, um, they also shared uh, some acquaintances, some common acquaintances, both in custody uh, as well as in the community. Um, uh, lastly, uh, they did have some housing overlap uh, on and off from December 29th, 2020 uh, to when Mr. Umfenauer was released from our custody on January 17th of 2024, uh, that they were both housed uh, in at the Idaho Maximum Security Institution. And there, there was frequent movement in between, but there were times within that time frame uh, where they shared uh, uh, they were in the same housing unit at our facilities. Uh, with that, uh, just again, want to express our thanks and appreciation uh, for what was a, a very tough ordeal for the Corrections family, um, but uh, thanking BPD and, and their response uh, well, now over 36 hours ago uh, to, to the ambush on our staff, but everybody uh, who's uh, offered assistance and put their shoulder in to help and bring these two suspects to justice. Thank you, Director. Um, we can't possibly name everyone who helped with this investigation and the last 36 hours, but of particular note, I would certainly like to thank the FBI for their assistance. They have been involved and were uh, also involved in the uh, pursuit and taking into custody of uh, these gentlemen down in Twin Falls area. We uh, appreciate them and virtually every county sheriff's office uh, between here and northern Idaho and uh, across to eastern Idaho. We uh, thank our partners here in the Treasure Valley for their assistance, uh, particularly uh, Josh Hurwitt, our U.S. attorney, has been involved and helpful along with the FBI. And the Ada County Prosecutor's Office has certainly be, been an integral part of this investigation, providing support and uh, all the needs that we have um, come across over the last 36 hours. So 
Again, I apologize for not being able to thank everyone, but there are a lot of folks who have come together to do some really good work and really uh, important work to take these two gentlemen, uh, and I use that term loosely, into custody um, before their path of destruction could get any wider. So thank you. We do have time for a couple of questions, but uh, we are limited uh, in what we can release at this point, and we uh, still have a lot of work to do um, to uh, make sure that we have investigated all of the leads that have come in. We've had hundreds of tips come in from the members of the public for which we are also grateful and would like to thank those who have taken the time to provide us with information as this case unfolded. A couple of questions for anyone, if you would. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we're certainly in the process of, of reviewing uh, our policies and practices, and, and I, I think there, there are two things that have to be evaluated in, in, that, uh, in this particular situation. The first is whether our staff uh, adhered to policies and practices, and, and I think we feel really comfortable at this point uh, in saying that our policies were followed, uh, security was actually augmented, as a result of, of, uh, of Meade's history. Um, uh, so they, they did in fact go above and beyond. The second piece of that, which falls squarely on me, is whether our policies and practices were sufficient enough to put our staff in a position to maintain their safety and security. And so that's the process that's ongoing right now uh, for department leadership as well as prisons leadership uh, to make sure that they're positioned as, as good as possible. But uh, I can tell you from our initial review of events uh, uh, facility leadership in, in authorizing that transport and augmenting resources as well as the conduct and performance of our staff in the execution of that of that transport uh, were wholly in line with our policies and practices. So there was more protection than was required? Correct. Director, one more question for you. Any insight into how someone who's in a maximum security prison in the most restricted part of that prison could have possibly coordinated this kind of escape? Uh, absolutely, that, and that's what we've turned our investigative resources towards uh, ferreting out. Uh, what we do know, and, and this is, uh, I think, a, a challenge that plagues corrections across the country, is contraband cell phones, uh, other third parties, other means of communicating. You know, one of our, one of the things we we try very hard to interdict are the abilities for people in custody to further their criminal activities on the outside or within our secure institutions. So we know that that there are ways that they attempt to thwart uh, our our procedures and, and our safeguards that we have in place uh, and, and that's what we're trying to figure out right now is exactly how what we we know with near certainty this was not an accident this was a planned event uh, and we're channeling every resource we have into trying to understand exactly how they went about planning it Yeah, the information we have is that he was he was in restraints uh, while he was being escorted out of the out of the hospital once uh, events transpired. I'll, I'll defer to uh, the, the the people investigating those events. But but yeah, he was he was in restraints. Is there any details you can share about what happened from the time they left the hospital to when they were arrested? And also, in terms of the homicide, is there any um, array of nice ties, or how is it possibly linked to them? The There's not a lot that we know. Obviously, our, our folks are still on the scenes of those homicides. It, it has not been that long since we found this out, so we're still investigating. In the coming days, we will, we will be able to learn more information about whether those ties exist or, or what happened. Uh, I, you asked about handcuffs. We did find the shackles at the scene of one of the homicides, so that's uh, one of the ways that we tied them together. Were they still driving the same vehicle? Uh, we found the uh, vehicle they escaped in up in uh, northern Idaho, and uh, they uh, took another vehicle. Uh, who, who put that out? Uh, it 
It's possible. Yeah, yes. So is it possible that they might have crossed state lines since the escape? It is possible. Uh, it is so recently that I can't give you a lot. I know uh, they were located. Uh, they determined that they were found, apparently, and they tried to flee. I don't know how long the pursuit lasted. Uh, it was in Twin Falls County, and uh, they were taken into custody without shots. Were they spotted by a member of the public or an police officer? How were they spotted? Uh, I don't know that information. Is one of these homicide We weren't there. Uh, they did have his car. I don't know. Uh, the investigation is so early, we don't know exactly what transpired. Did it happen to be a Chrysler Pacifica? Yeah. Uh, I do not know. Because that's what he was seen, uh, they say, in, in Missoula Sorry, Pacifica. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, as the investigation proceeds and we develop more information, uh, there'll probably there's a good chance there'll be prosecution in several different locations. Whose car was the Honda Civic or Honda Accord that you all mentioned? Was it Umpenauer's or was it stolen? It was reported stolen. And I think uh, we're going to cut it off at that point. One more last question. How, do you, how did you come to the conclusion that you associate the, the two extra homicides with this case? Uh, by information that we developed on the scenes of the homicide, and I'm, I can't go much further than that. And the homicide took place today? Uh, in, the last 24 in the last 24 hours. And that's truly all. Thank you, okay, folks. Bodies found together. No. no. Okay. All right. We just heard from Boise Police Chief Ron Weiniger. We heard from Idaho State Police as well as the Idaho Department of Correction. They said that those two suspects, Nicholas Umfenauer and IDOC inmate Skyler Mead, were found in Twin Falls County. This after early yesterday morning, uh, Umfenauer showed up allegedly at St. Alphonsus and shot officers as they were taking Skyler Mead out of St. Alphonsus. Uh, we are told that Skyler Mead was in restraints at this time. It was a ambush type attack yeah. and had to have been coordinated somehow. Idaho uh, Department of Correction along with U.S. Attorney's Office, FBI, everybody's investigating how exactly they planned this while Mead was inside uh, Idaho Maximum Security Institute. And we did get a little bit of indication on what possibly could have happened here. We did learn that Nicholas Umfenauer and Skylar Mead, that they, they were together at some point during their incarceration at mm -hmm. IDOC. I want to show you this map here right now and something that was brought up. Idaho State Police says that there were two homicides that have happened here in the state of Idaho over the last 24 hours, we believe, that are possibly connected to both Mead and Umfenauer. We'll show you this map right now. We'll start with the top up at Leland Clear Clearwater and Nez Perce County. You can see up in that area there's a possibility of two homicides that were connected to both of these men. And Morgan, something that I thought was extremely uh, interesting was that the Idaho State Police, they're telling us that the prison shackles or the IDOC mm -hmm. shackles that were supposedly on Mr. Mead, they were found at one of the scenes of the homicide. So exactly. that's kind of how they start to connect two and two. But if you take a look at this map, and again, the men arrested in Twin Falls and believe they're being taken to the Twin Falls jail as we speak. All of this happening, by the way, about two mm -hmm. o'clock, so about an hour ago. Uh, you can see, though, they, they went all around the state of Idaho after uh, basically leaving Boise about two o'clock yesterday morning. Yeah, exactly. So that incident with IDOC officers happened in Boise. We're told that they made their way up north to both both Nez Perce and Clearwater counties, and that is allegedly where uh, law enforcement believes that two homicides that could be connected to these two individuals occurred. They say that they found the suspect's car that they got away from uh, St. Alphonsus with, they found that car in Leland, Idaho. You can see that on the map. And then again, as Joe said, they were found in Twin Falls today. It's important to note this happened after a short car chase and both suspects were taken into custody without any shots fired. No extensive use of force was used in this situation, according to Boise's police chief Ron Weiniger. Uh, and again, it happened within the last hour. Numerous tips came in from across the state and the region. And law enforcement is really grateful for the collaboration that they had with surrounding agencies after specifically that blue alert came out yesterday late morning and something else I did want to touch on uh, while we have you here we did get an update on those IDOC officers that mm -hmm. were injured they were shot yesterday we've learned that two officers do remain hospitalized we're not exactly sure what their condition is but the indication was they are doing better mm -hmm. and they do not have life-threatening injuries exactly. and we did learn that one IDOC officer was released again we've reported that two officers were shot by who we now know as Nicholas Umfenauer another was incidentally shot by a BPD officer we're not exactly sure who was released and what mm. conditions are out there. But um, I did want to add quickly that Nicholas Umfenauer, again, the man who came and picked up Mead from the hospital early yesterday morning, we just learned during that news conference, he was released from the, the state prison here yep. in January of this year. Yeah, exactly. And as Joe mentioned, uh, IDOC's director, Josh Tewalt, saying that he and Mead shared some overlap time in that maximum security prison. And they are both members of the white supremacist prison gang, Aryan Knights. Police are still in
investigating how exactly these two other homicides that occurred in North Idaho are connected to these two men. It is still a very active situation with detectives still on scene up in North Idaho. But again, those two IDOC officers that are still in the hospital are recovering. They are stable. One officer uh, was released from the hospital, and T. Walt said that their spirits certainly lifted when he told them that these suspects have been found, Joe. And we know over the next several days and probably weeks and months, we're going to learn more and more about the situation. If you were curious, though, other than the IDOC crossover between these two gentlemen, what connections do they have? Um, uh, we heard from state police that they do believe there are some shared connections within mm -hmm. social circles between these two men. Again, and in the prison. And in the prison, mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, that, that Aryan Knight prison gang, uh, as Director Tawalt was saying, they know it's a problem. It's something they monitor. The question is now is how did all this come together and how do they prevent it from happening again? Yeah, he elaborated as well about how difficult it is sometimes to trace and track communication from inside prison as well as outside prison. They have a system in prison that they use to message people outside called JPay, but certainly in something like this, uh, it's likely, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be used. It's possible that there was contraband cell phones. Uh, T. Walt said that that's really common inside Idaho Department of Correction, and they try so hard to intercept and mitigate any of that going on, but it's really difficult. And so their staff is investigating again how exactly they were able to coordinate this attack that they're calling planned. He said, quote, there are ways they attempt to thwart procedures and safeguards in place and so that's exactly what they're trying to figure out right now joe well if you're just joining us here on news channel 7 we are live here bringing you coverage after a uh, press conference again we want to tell you that the two men that law enforcement across the state of idaho the two men they are looking for after a shooting and a prison break really from uh, st alphonsus yesterday both men have been arrested without incident in twin falls however idaho state police tell us that there's been two homicides really up in north idaho mm -hmm. that are possibly connected to this something that we'll definitely have to dig into over the next several days yeah, still several questions, but uh, we want to thank law enforcement from across the state, as you heard from the full